Our next speaker is uh, Dean Markwick, and uh, he's with the Bank of America. He's going to be talking about simulating RFQ trading in Julia. Or the fun title, more dealers, more problems. Um, yeah, so I'm a quant analyst at Bank of America, and I've been using Julia since 2015. Um, it's all simulation data in this and all the other compliance stuff as well. Uh, no Bank of America data is in this at all. Um, so RFQ or RFS trading. RFQ trading is uh, something that we participate in. So clients come to us at Bank of America and they ask for a trade of some size and some currency pair. And at the same time, they're asking other people as well. So that person, when they're doing the trade, they're asking N liquidity providers or NLPs. And they're asking for a price and a size. They get all the quotes back from us at Bank of America and at all the other banks. And then they trade on whoever gives them the best price. Um, we've also got RFS, which is a request for a stream, where we're continuously providing prices for size over time. And then when the person wants to trade, they'll click the button and it will go automatically to the best provider. But overall, all the LPs are competing to be top of the stack and be the best price so we can win the trade, get some revenue, and hopefully make a profit off that trade. The actual reality of this type of trading, though, is that we win the trade and it could immediately start losing money. So this is a mark out plot. What's happening before the trade is the blue line. The market's not really doing anything. It's nice and flat. We get traded and sometimes it goes in our favor, but most of the time it goes red and we're immediately losing money uh, for some reason. The trade is happening at that dashed line. So we're either going long and the market starts falling down or we're short and the market starts going up. And really, this is a big problem. and We need to work out why this actually happens. This is called the winner's curse, uh, and in this simulated framework that we use Julia to simulate, uh, the trade is won when the LP is at the top of the stack, um, uh, but there's many other reasons you could win the trade, etc., etc. So why does the market actually move at the end of the day? This is a mathematical model that we, is written by a guy called Raoulman from Deutsche Bank called Executing in an Aggregator, and this tries to explain why the market moves based on the number of people that are in competition with each other at a given time. There's a true price, P star, and no one can observe it. And each liquidity provider is trying to guess what P star is using their own price P, and then streaming out that P price plus some spread, which is the cost of trading to all the people that want to trade. And now in Julia, this is very easy to simulate and a really easy to build a quick model um, that comes up with these dynamics. And we'll use this as a playground to really explore the different dynamics in trading and what happens when the different liquidity providers change their behaviors and things around those different parameters. Some Julia code really to say, show how easy it is to write that code. Um, yeah, I like Julia. I think it makes a much nicer way to simulate these types of problems and say Python or things like that. So the key result, um, we find that when we're in competition with more LPs, that the trader actually gets a better price because they're asking more people and they're able to find out who's got the uh, best price on the street at a given time. So if they ask one, the cost of trading is one unit. If they ask two, it's about 0.6. And that falls with each additional LP that they're asking. But this comes at quite a big cost. This is where that winner's curse comes in. And we start to find that the more people that are asked, leads to this mark out where the market moves away much faster and much quicker. So when someone asks just three people for their prices and the trade happens, the mark out is fairly shallow. It still goes the wrong direction, but it's not too bad. When they ask 10, the orange line, it moves much more quicker and moves to a lower level. And then when they ask 25, it moves down further even more. So it looks like that even though there's no essential alpha in the trade or anything from this simulated framework, by increasing the number of LPs in competition, this is where that adverse market movement appears to come from. There'll be other factors, of course, but hopefully you can see that by reducing the number of people that you ask, you get slightly better market impacts afterwards. So this is a presentation I've been taking to clients and showing them and hopefully explaining different dynamics and what can help explain. On our side, we can use it to help understand our pricing strategies as well. So let's say Bank of America and someone else are in competition with two other liquidity providers, and we know or we're roughly guessing that they're going to charge one unit per trade. What should we charge to win as much trade uh, flow as possible, but at the same time maximize our revenue? So again, using the simulation framework, we can go through lots of different iterations and see what actually happens to the economics under this. 
So on the x-axis here is that spread that we're going to charge relative to everyone else. So if we charge one, we're charging the same as everyone else. And everyone else wins 33% of the market share. So we're all winning one trade randomly over enough timescales. If we start to charge slightly less, our market share increases because we're winning more of the overall trading. But our total revenue is going down because we're not making as much on each trade because we're charging less. And then the opposite direction is true as well. As we start to increase our cost of, or increase the price we're charging, we win less, but we, we make slightly less as well because of that. So it turns out we can try and work out what the optimal value is, and we find that actually it's around 0.9 if everyone else is charging one. Very basic model, very basic dynamics, but the Julia gives us the ability to build up these sorts of simulations across uh, lots of different currency pairs and lots of different uh, parameters that we might use. We can calibrate it to real data to understand the parameters better and really use it to help educate us in our different strategies. Um, there's also the added benefit of moving to a more machine learning framework and adversarial behaviors. In this simple example, people are always charging one and they never change how they do. But in real life, we know that if we start winning more, they're going to start trying to win more as well, and they're going to change their behaviors. So we need to account for that some way, and we can build out really complicated adversarial dynamics and put like agent-based models on this type of behavior and see how we should react. So overall, I hope you're convinced that it's an interesting problem that we need to consider, and that how simple models can get us close to real-world dynamics, and that you can start from something very basic, very easy simulations, and it replicates what's happening in the real world quite well. And we use this really to, for ourselves, like I said, to explore the different dynamics, but also educate the clients on their behaviors and how that might help. And the Julia is just a great language to do this in because it's fast, lots of different other packages available. And yeah, I just like using Julia. Thank you. Any questions? So uh, can you elaborate a little bit on the winner's curse? Like why, why would you win a trade you immediately start to lose money? So in this case, it's because you're the most wrong price, it appears. So you're getting that trade because you're the best price of that person. So you're sticking out from the pack. So that's why essentially you, you didn't know what everyone else knew, that that wasn't a good trade to win. So you wasn't able to pull back. Hence why the market moves afterwards. It's just to be clear, you're off the implication and then you have to execute it. Yes, the yeah, yes, exactly, yeah. But then, then you might be sensitive, to, you might be uh, scale sensitive. If, if I'm doing like, you know, a $100 million trade versus I'm doing a $1 million trade, it's going to take you a while to, yeah, just, yeah. You know, to, get, to, get the, you know, to get the order queue right. Yeah, so in practice, the, the market moving against us is partly our fault as well as we hedge out the risk. So on our larger trades, and we're going to the market and moving the market as we're uh, hedging out that risk, it's the same sort of thing. But what this simulation is trying to show that um, the winner's curse emerges quite naturally from the different amount of people that are in competition rather than any um, other uh, external factors in this case. So, yeah, uh, in reality, the market moves away for two different reasons, our behavior and also this winner's curse. All right, any other questions? Okay. Thank you for All your right. time, everyone. Let's just thank speaker again, please.